everyone. Thanks for joining us for our November Braille Literacy Canada workshop. Uh, so before I get started and introduce the presentation and our speaker today, I'm just going to ask everyone to mute. So if you're using an iPhone, you'll see that there's a mute button on the bottom uh, of your screen. And if you're on a PC, you can use the keystroke Alt A to mute and unmute. And on a Mac, it's Option A um, to mute and right. unmute. So I'll just ask you all to mute. And then when we get to the question period, you'll have the chance to, to share your question or to write in the chat or raise your hand. Um, during the presentation, if you do have a question, you can you can raise your hand or write in the chat. But what we're going to do is is leave some time for questions at the end. All right. So uh, for those who don't know, I'm Natalie Martinello. I'm the president of Braille Literacy Canada. We hold workshops every two months on different Braille related topics. And today we're very happy to have Bonnie Reed with us who will be talking about the early Braille literacy guidelines. So in late 2020, uh, the Braille Authority of North America released new guidelines for the transcription of early educational materials from print to Braille. Um, we're very happy to have Bonnie with us today because she's one of the lead authors um, for these guidelines. Bonnie has been providing Braille services for Saskatchewan students since uh, 1984. She holds certification as a Braille transcriber in literary and technical materials. She also holds uh, NEMIS certification and an instructor certification for literary and technical transcription. Although she is no longer transcribing for the Saskatchewan Alternate Format Material Library, she continues to provide transcription services for the network, uh, the National Network of Equitable Library Services, NELS. She has been pre she's presented many workshops on Braille transcription for uh, the CNIB uh, conference, among many others as well. And we are very happy to have you here with us, Bonnie. I know there are many other things we can say about you. Bonnie is also a longtime uh, supporter and member and friend of Braille Literacy Canada. And so uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Bonnie. And thank you again, for everyone, for attending. Um, for those who just trickled in, I'll just ask for you to stay muted. Um, during the presentation, and we'll have time for questions. So again, um, Alt-A if you're on the computer or the mute, unmute button on your iPhone. And if you're calling in by phone, it's star six to mute and unmute. So thank you, Bonnie. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. It's it's a privilege to, to be here and join you this afternoon. Um, and thank you for attending this workshop. Um, I have it in a PowerPoint format, which I'll bring up shortly. And what I've got is I'm doing a brief summary of each of the guidelines with hopefully lots of examples that will be helpful and useful. Um, but of course, when transcribing early literacy, early literacy material, always be sure to refer to the complete guidelines as well as the Braille formats. Um, references to the Braille formats are included in the uh, early literacy guidelines um, in different places, and so you'll have those throughout. Uh, now, we may not get through all the examples. My document is quite long, but they're there for your reference. So even if we don't get a chance to look at them all today, they're easy to look at and understand what's going on. Basically, the examples that I've present, I'll be presenting are done on 11, 11 by half, uh, half, 11 and a half paper with a 40 cell 25 line. Um, so you can also remember then that if you're working with the smaller sheets of paper for younger students, you may have to, of course, adjust how you position things, um, whether you're doing eight and a half by 11 portrait or landscape or something else. So there's <clears throat> there's flexibility in there depending on what 
uh, size of paper, and we'll touch on that in just a minute. So now, uh, Natalie, let's see if I can bring up my PowerPoint. If I open the PowerPoint first, or if I share the screen first, which do I do? So you, you should can... uh, open the PowerPoint first, start your show, and then share that that screen. Okay. Now, how do I share? Because my share screen icon now has disappeared. Uh, it, you should still be able to. You should still no, not, see it. I'm not seeing it anywhere. Is it under more? Has it been? Um, hmm. Just a minute. It's got to be here somewhere. You should see it. Um, there should be like a share screen button. Yeah, it was there before I opened the PowerPoint. Just a minute. If I go like this, now, does that help? Did you get it? Uh, we, it? no. Didn't get it yet? Well, where in the world did it go? I should have tested this out now. It's got to be here somewhere. It'll be in the Zoom window itself. So if you go back to Zoom along the bottom, you should yeah, have Yeah, I clicked buttons. on the share. I see the share screen there now. OK, so click share screen, and then you should be able to select your, your PowerPoint window. Um, is that working? Hmm. OK, just a minute. Here we go. That looks oh, better. There. Oh, this, there we go. This looks okay. hopeful. Yeah, there you there go. <laughs> <laughs> Technical All right. difficulty. <laughs> well, it just, it, you know, each time I open up my computer and sit to it, things are different and I'm confused. Yeah, and it recently updated. So <laughs> there you go. Perfect. They update in the night when I'm not, uh, when I'm unaware. All right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. All right. So I'm going to launch right into this with guideline number one, and then we're just going to zoom through it. Um, I would recommend if you have a question as we go along, maybe just jot down what um, what frame or what the title is that's on the page so that I can kind of refer back to it when you ask the question, if there's some way you can identify the page that you have a question about. And also just uh, to add for uh, anyone who would like the PowerPoint, um, so you'll be able to follow along um, if you're not able to see the slides, Bonnie will describe as she's going along, but I, I will also send the PowerPoint to all the participants after the session as well. Yes. All right, then. Um, let's see if we can get going. So our guideline number one talks about the physical page attributes. Now, some of these things most of you will know. Um, and so what we'll notice as we go through things that there's mostly what it is, is following Braille formats, but for early literacy, um, for young students, there's a few things we do a little bit differently than what format says. So this is, these are the differences that will show up as we go. But a lot of it will, will be the same as what is in Braille format. Um, as I've said before, um, the standard size is 11 by 11 and a half, and you all know that. Kindergarten to first grade can use eight and a half by 11 landscape or vertical um, and smaller sheets of any kind can be used to accommodate small hands. Now that's more for in-house work, um, of course, rather than work that would be uh, circulated. Work that circulated would be restricted more to the eight and a half by 11 or the 11 by 11. Uh, the volume size we recommend for kindergarten through third grade is 50 pages. Um, and the text is broken at a logical spot, um, preferably at a chapter unit section sort of thing. Workbook and activity sheets, of course, we would break and start a new activity on a new page. Okay, I think most of that is probably familiar to you. Spacing is a little bit different with early literacy. Kindergarten to first grade. Uh, now, see, I've got that as first grade instead of grade one. That's American. I've been doing workshops in both Canada and the United States, so some of the terminology is, is mixed up. We double space kindergarten and grade one work, okay, except for specific uh, areas that wouldn't be, and that is the preliminary pages, for example, your title pages, your transcriber's note, and, and uh, special symbols. Certain puzzles can't be uh, double spaced. 
special problems in math, of course. And we'll see an example of all these things as we go through the document today. Titles and uh, tactile graphics, charts and tables, between column heading and separation line, alphabetic page numbers, after top box line or before the bottom box line that's inside the box. So we'll, we'll see examples of all those things as we go along. And basically that's what just, guideline one just sets out that style of, of how you do things. Guideline two talks about transcriber generated pages. And these aren't as difficult as they seem. Um, they include the title page, subsequent title pages, special symbols pages and transcribers note pages. And they're provided in each volume. Now this title here that we've got teachers reference materials that doesn't go in the braille um, edition, but it can go at the top of the print pages uh, for the teacher's benefit, okay? If you don't use it, it's not the end of the world and it's not necessarily wrong, but um, it can be included just as a clarification for the teacher on the print pages only. Uh, but the first one is the special symbols that are used in a volume. And I've just listed a few here as an example of the types of things that you would list. We don't need to go through them all. I've just listed a few examples of um, what would be on the special symbols page. And in early literacy, um, there wouldn't be that many because uh, there's a lot of symbols we just don't use in early literacy, as we'll see as we go along. Here's a sample of a transcriber's note page. The first paragraph includes all the code books and guidelines that you would use for your, your document as you transcribe it. So it would have the rules of unified English Braille, uh, guidelines for early transcription of material, um, Braille formats, uh, guidelines for tactile graphics. And then if you use uh, guidelines for technical material, that would be listed as well. Then after that, you list other things that appear in um, the book that you're transcribing and how you handle them. For example, I've listed here pictures to be identified by name are omitted. That transcriber's note appears somewhere in the document. Um, and writing activities are omitted. That appears somewhere in the document. And we'll see a little bit more of that in just a minute here as I turn the next page. Um, this is just a continuation to show you the types of transcribers notes that could be included. Now, all of these, you, you would customize it to your particular book. I've got one here that talks about words that are with crossed out letters are uncontracted, then repeated with a hyphen. Um, and substituted with a crossed out letter. So it's an explanation is what it is of um, what you're doing in the text for the student. There's another one that talks about uh, transcribers note that appear in this volume are listed below. Okay, so all the transcribers notes in a particular student book that we're creating are listed on the transcribers note page in braille and in print. Um, and that's just to assist the teacher as much as the student in knowing, because remember our early literacy students um, can't read that much. Uh, and perhaps don't know what those transcribers notes are or what they're about. So this is just to help you um, know, and we list them by page number that they appear in the book, and then what the actual one is. We'll see all these, these ones that are listed here by page number. Uh, we'll see those in action as we go through the text. So now we've, we've seen what a transcribers note, a special symbols note page looks like. So then guideline three just tells you um, how to put a transcriber's note in. And I'm guessing that most of you know this. Um, of course, the transcriber's note is used to indicate and explain omissions, changes in format or additional additions to what's in the print. Um, there to integrate interruptions or describe pictures or diagrams to list keys or to indicate uncommon use of braille symbols and things like that. Um, the format for the transcribers note is the same as braille formats. Uh, it's in seven with runovers in five, preceded and followed by the um, transcriber note indicator. And for first grade, kindergarten first grade limit the note to as few words as possible. Um, and then write the notes 
in the language that reflects the grade level. And I think you're probably all familiar with that. So that's fairly standard. Um, here's some examples of kindergarten to first grade. We've got a transcriber's note that just says picture. That may be all you need to alert the student that something is there that hasn't been reproduced or that is going to be talked about or something like that. So you can keep it as simple as just the word picture, or you could say picture omitted if you want to let the student know that the picture is not being dealt with in a braille format. Um, in second and third grades, it could say pictures are described, um, or it could say pictures to be identified by name are described. That's a little bit longer, but still try uh, to keep them as brief as possible, understanding the um, reading level and ability of the student whenever you can. So those are just examples of what could be. Okay, so then we look at the ink print pages and I've, this is guideline four and I've mentioned this already. And this is a reminder um, that the ink print pages would be included in each volume. Uh, this is optional, um, but they're there to assist the teacher or the EA that's working with the student that may not be 100% fluent in Braille, but needs to kind of know what's going on. Okay. Um, a print copy of the title page is always included. And then the other recommended ones um, for print pages could be what we call the teacher's reference material. So in other words, the special symbols pages and the transcriber's note pages. And I pretty sure that you're all familiar with that, but not all agencies and not all Braille uh, productions include the special symbols in the transcriber's notes in a print version. In early literacy, especially, it, it's a good idea just to assist um, and make it a little bit easier. So we, we kind of recommend that those could be included in print as well. All right, so now let's look at putting some things together in our uh, documents. So guideline five talks about type form indicators. And as I mentioned before, be sure to look at the, doc the full guideline document for each one of these things too, because there's more in it than what I've included here. Now in kindergarten, we recommend that all font attributes be omitted. Um, the student isn't reading fluently, of course, at that stage, and extra dots can cause things to change the way they look. Um, even something as simple as an italics changes the shape of the braille word and um, can sometimes present difficulties for the student when they're just learning their alphabet or their contractions or whatever it is. Um, list this omission on the transcriber's note page so that the, the teacher or the EA that's working with the student knows that all font attributes have been omitted and then they won't be looking for them. At first grade, you can evaluate and use the fonts if possible, um, but use as few uh, font changes as possible still, and only use them when necessary. Um, in one case, for example, you could, uh, where there might be two fonts, italics and bold, you could use the italics to indicate both of them if it's not necessary to distinguish the bold separately. So there might be times when, you know, they're just emphasizing a word um, and it doesn't matter if it's bold or italics, it's just wanting it to stand out. Um, so you could, but you would have to assess the entire book beforehand and make sure that you could do that without causing any um, identification problems in the words in the, in the book itself. Okay, so now starting with this guideline five with type form. So let's look at a few examples. Now what I've done with the examples is I've repeated the print copy on each braille page just so we don't have to flip back and forth between slides so that's why you see the print page appearing several times in the document now um, uh, this one is a kindergarten grade one level and it's learning the letter sounds so we're looking at long vowel sounds a e i o and u okay now the a e i o and u are in blue type and then the word long sound, long vowel is in blue type in the sentence, long vowel sounds say their own name. 
the long A shows up in blue and the A in the word snake as the example shows up in blue. So all those things are in blue. In kindergarten grade one, we eliminate those. Uh, the sentence is very self-explanatory. It says the letters A, E, I, O, and U are vowels. So there's really no need um, to have the color shown. Okay, the, the sentence is very clear. The second sentence, long vowels sounds say their own name. That's a very clear statement of what's happening. So there's no need to add the blue color, okay? Then later on, uh, it has A, E, I, O, U down the side of the page, and it's got pictures, and you're to circle or put an X on the picture that has that long vowel sound. So what we've done in the Braille is we put the A at the margin, and then we have spelled the words cake, skate, frog, and rake. Uh, following that letter A, and then the student would be asked to either underline or circle or something like that. Uh, you see that it's all double spaced because it's kindergarten, grade one level. And so that's what we, we have done there. <clears throat> um, brailing the words in place of the pictures did not create a problem with answering as far as the student was concerned, so we were able to easily use um, words for the pictures. Um, this one shows letters and sounds that they want the student to print, the capital S and the lowercase s. And they show how to make the S and then they've got lines for you to copy that. Um, normally writing things like that would be omitted. But what we did here is we, we showed the we took out the S, the first two S's are in red, and then there's the other ones are in bold and gray. So there's lots of color being used again. And we overlooked all that color and just simply brailed it a capital S and a small S, and then the sentence print S and S. So it's a capital S and a small S. Then I included, now this is a little tricky for grade, grade one, but I did include this um, grade one word indicator with the um, use symbol in front of it and closed it at the end so that I could put those capital S and small s's inside there and the student would see exactly how they would look if they were to braille them. So it removed all the extra symbols that you normally wouldn't use because a student, if they're brailling um, work, just need to learn the letter itself, the capital S and the lowercase s. So I removed the grade one indicators so that the student could just see the letter. And then the bottom part of this page shows uh, four pictures. Uh, and it says, look at the picture, pictures, print the beginning letter on each word. And they show that the star is done. There's a little space there, lines for the letter star S to be printed. And there's our first transcriber's note. After the star, and I brailled the star uncontracted, followed by the contracted format, and after that, I said picture. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I've got that. Um, right, my mistake. That's not that's not the, the transcribers know what I was thinking of. There's a different one coming up later. Um, so I brailled the word star uncontracted and then contracted to show both formats because it was filled in in print. Now, the second picture is a spider and it leaves the, the first letter missing so that you can add the S. And in that spot, I put picture spider. And again, I brailled it uncontracted and then contracted inside the transcriber's note. Um, the, and then I put the underscore indicator in front of the P-I-D-E-R so they would know that there was something missing they had to fill in. Okay. And then the next picture just says spoon. And that's braille the same way with the underscore for the omission and then the P-O-O-N. And then the picture swing. And again, I did it uncontracted and contracted in the same way. Okay. All right, so that was kindergarten grade one with font attributes. Now in second and third grades, font attributes can be used but still evaluate and use as few as possible. Keep the document as uncluttered as you can possibly keep it. Uh, so keep it to a minimum. Print colors and highlighting. 
uh, evaluate and eliminate if possible and cut back again to a minimum. If necessary to reflect, then follow the UEB guidelines for the appropriate symbols. Um, and, and that's very tricky because I know I've seen a lot of early literacy um, activity books and textbooks that are just loaded with colors and it's attractive in a way, but not always necessary or useful. So it's a tough call as to what to, what to ignore and what to leave in. Um, so here's a first example then, it's a grade two level and you see that there's bold in it. There's the, the first thing we see is um, Sue and Luke are playing flutes. And so they're going to work with the long U sound. Now, this there's a yellow box here that has a paragraph in it talking about the syllables and the long U sound. I did not put that in a box, but you could, and it would be all right. Um, it's debatable whether at the early grades that box is confusing and causing clutter um, or whether it's useful. So sometimes it's just not necessary. It was a paragraph before and after and made it a paragraph. Um, if you put a box in, you wouldn't be doing it wrong. Uh, just sort of, if you can know your student and um, if you don't know your student and you're doing it for circulation purposes, you just have to make a call. And what you would do in a case like that is look through the entire book and be consistent. If you're going to use the box, use it throughout in all the similar situations. Uh, this book that I took this sample from has repeated pages with the same format with the yellow box and a blue box and then the questions. And so um, as long as you pick a format, then you stay with it throughout the text. So then we have inside that yellow box, we have a the letter U is bold and the words Sue, Luke and flutes are bold. I did not reflect those bolds. I didn't think that it was necessary because the sentences explained everything clearly again. Um, after that, I brailled, here's what to do. And that's actually in a blue box. And again, in that box, it says circle the answer yes or no for each sentence. Yes and no is bold. I didn't think it was necessary because the sentence was, was very uh, self-explanatory. And the capital U is bold. And I did not reflect that because it already has to have a grade one indicator and then the capital U when it's standing alone. So we didn't want to add another symbol to it uh, and clutter it up. So we didn't reflect any of the bold in this particular situation. Then the sentence in underneath where it says a red vase is blue and you're to answer yes or no. We started at the margin with the sentence, a red vase is blue, and then left a blank line. We're still in double spacing because they have to do a circle or an underline or something around the yes or no. So we put it in cell three. We put two blank cells between the two words, and then we double space the assignment to give the student room to underline or circle or do what, what the teacher uh, asks them to do. Um, you're to print the answer on the line in the print but in this case, the student would just be able to underline it, or maybe the student would, or the teacher would have him braille the word after the yes or no. Um, and there's room for that as well. So we left options for what the teacher might want them to do in that case. Okay. So that's just dealing with a little bit of, little bit of bold. Um, we'll see a lot more color coming up as we go. So on to guideline six then, um, this is line spacing relevant to headings, poetry, block text and tactile graphics. And even though we're double spacing at certain times, there's certain times we have to single space. Now, if you're in a double spaced um, work, which would be kindergarten grade one, um, you use two blank lines between blocked paragraphs, between stanzas of poetry and plays, before and after centered heading, before and after a list, before a cell five heading, before and after box lines, before and after tactile graphic, and before exercise directions. So basically what we've done here, it's pretty obvious by looking at the list, wherever there's one blank line in single space material, we have to add two because the regular text is single spaced or is uh, double spaced, sorry. 
Um, so ov obviously then we have to put an extra blank line anywhere that there would be normally a blank line in single spaced work. So let's take a peek at that. So here we have in this particular example, it's a grade one page and it's called reading comprehension. And we've got reading comprehension as a centered heading at the top on line one. We left two blank lines because the next one we've got is a heading called poetry. Um, and it, it was like we had three sets of headings here. So the third one down, it says reading poetry and that is a cell five heading. So we have two blank lines in between the first two headings, two blank lines in between the centered heading and the cell five heading, and then a blank line before the, the uh, uh, instructions because it is double spaced. And then we have read, look at the pictures and answer the questions, okay, as our instructions. Then we have two blank lines because after the instructions, we start a little poem. And we've got the poem done and it's got two lines in each stanza and there's three stanzas. So in the winter, we, uh, we wait for snow, then it's off to the hill we go. So that's the first stanza and it's got two blank lines before it, two blank lines after it, and then the next stanza. Okay, I'm gonna continue on the next page with the last stanza of that poem. And then there's two blank lines between it and the next set of instructions that says underline the right answer. Now in print, the word underline is underlined, not necessary to underline it. It's clear by stating underline the right answer. So that extra set of um, type form indicators is not necessary. Um, and then it has the questions, what form of writing is this? And then the answer options was poem and story. You're to write it on the line, but again, we did it uh, similar to what we did previously. We started the sentence at the margin and then indented the answers in cell three, poem and two blank cells and story beside that. And we left a blank line. We double spaced this partly because it was grade one and partly because the student needed room to be able to put in an answer. And if you're using 11 by 11 paper, there is room that the student could braille the answer, the correct answer, following the choices if they wanted to, and that sort of thing. So that's how, how that goes. Um, here's an example of just um, spacing more than anything, where you see that the first line has got story elements. This is grade one again. Um, and it's a centered heading. We've got two blank lines. The next centered heading is personal connection and two blank lines. And then again, a cell five heading that says making a connection to the story. So we've got three sets of headings there again. And then we've got a set of instructions. And that set of instructions is then followed by a little paragraph story that's in a purple box. It says at the park. I didn't include the box, but I included the two blank lines before the centered heading at the park and two blank lines after it before I started the little story. So um, I don't didn't feel that the blank lines were necessary. And then we have the story. And then on the next page, there's uh, the two questions that are you to answer from the story. What was or what has scared you and what made you feel better? So the story is about a little girl that got frightened. What I did here was because I had the room, especially I left lots of room for the student to write an answer. I left five lines blank between each question for the student to, to braille in an answer. And that way there was lots of room for them to orientate their paper if they're using a Perkins brailler or something of that nature, okay. The one, one thing to know with grade one, um, kindergarten grade one, even grade two material, if they're to answer on the sheet that they're given, be generous enough with the lines whenever possible so that um, they have lots of room to um, get their paper in the machine and that it's, it's difficult sometimes to get it lined up. Okay, now we have an example of a grade two, and this is a glossary um, item. And I, it shows a bit of spacing 
and um, spatial arrangements and things like that. So we've got a centered heading that says glossary words. Because this glossary has um, keywords and diagrams as well as words, then we treat the entry word or the keyword as a cell five heading. And that comes right out of the um, Braille formats guideline, uh, guidelines. So we have regrouping to add, then we have a diagram and that's done as a tactile diagram showing the tens and the ones columns with the, the bars and the dots. And uh, part of it is circled and it's showing that it goes into the other box. Then underneath that, we've put in the part that is in a little speech bubble. Um, the total is three ten, tens, 11 ones. And um, if I trade 10 ones for a 10, it's easier to see that the total is 41. So they're just showing that in the diagram. Then below that, they've shown the um, spatial arrangement, 25 plus 16 with the line and 41. Now I've shown you two examples of that. One with the separation line just going under the numbers one with a separation line going under the plus sign as well as the numbers. Uh, the guidelines for technical material, technical material show it the first way with just the guidelines under the numbers. That's the standard way. The second way with it going underneath the plus sign as well is not wrong. It can be done that way. Be sure if you're doing any work at all at a certain grade level, it consistent throughout the book. Okay, the reason this one gets a little bit tricky is if you just have single digit numbers, um, then your separation line is very short and it might be difficult for them to read, in which case then you could use the longer one. But be consistent within um, a textbook that you're doing or a set of activities that you're doing. And then finally, uh, the last entry with this adding or regrouping to add shows another uh, tens and ones diagram and it's empty. It wants the student to fill it in. And that said, draw a picture to show how to add 34 plus 28 and then write the number sentence. So then it's an activity for them to do. And that was done as a tactile drawing as well so that it reflected the same as the one um, above it. Grade three level, this is another math example now and it's, it's a busy one. Um, we have, um, Math Makes Sense 3 Practice. So this is the book I took it out of, and I use that as a running head in this case, rather than a, this isn't a centered heading, this is a running head. Uh, my centered heading is Unit 3, Lesson 10, and using mental math to subtract is my um, centered heading, grouped centered heading. Now we're in grade three level, so we're single spaced now. So we just have the one blank line before and after the centered heading that says quick review. And then we have a set of sentences under the quick review. And then we have some bulleted material that says use a friendly number. So we put that bullet at the margin. Underneath that is a speech bubble or a cloud that says think, and we just grab that indented in cell three as the runover spot. Um, we didn't include the cloud or anything. And then we have 40 is close to 36, a simple sentence. 73 minus 40 equals 33, another equation. Um, so comma, 73 minus 36 is 37. And that's all just individual sentences underneath that bullet. And it works out very nicely. There's Bonnie, another um, yep. oh, Sorry about that. Just a, a quick... Um interruption because I see Debbie has her hand raised. So I just want to see if that's a clarification question. Debbie. Debbie uh, no, and Natalie, I'll wait until the general question piece. I just wanted to raise it now. So I'm in. Okay, in perfect. Place. Perfect. Okay. Just checking. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about <Okay>. that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have two bullet bullets that work in the same. They're just examples and we treated them the same. Then we get to the um, section where it says, try these, that's a, that's a centered heading. We used it as a centered heading. And then it says, use mental math. We have a number one that says subtract and we have an A, B, C, D, E, F. And those are horizontal 
um, equation, 72 minus 29 equals, for example. They have a blank after the equal sign in print. We do not need to include that in Braille. After the equal sign, we just leave a space. We just leave it empty. This is double spaced deliberately so that the student could work and put their answer after the equal sign on the actual worksheet. If you're not using it as consumable material, you could close that in and just make it a, a single spaced list, okay? So that's the choice you have to decide depending on how the material um, is being used. And then number two says subtract and they show uh, four spatial arrangements there, 51 minus 36 underneath it with the separation line. And you can do these across the page as you see with two, um, sorry, three blank lines between the questions um, and then carry on down into the next. Leave two blank lines between the first row of spatial arrangements and the second row of spatial arrangements so that student could insert an answer. Again, if it, it's a textbook and it's not being consumed, then just one blank line would be left. Okay. All right, let's move along to guideline seven talks about workbooks and spellers. So we get a little bit more and we'll see some of the things that we've already done. Um, in a horizontal word list, we use two blank cells between words. That's an ELMP guideline. Braille formats will tell you that you use one blank uh, one cell between words. So this is one of the differences that we've created. And we've done that deliberately so that it just separates the words a little bit more for the early reader. Um, and hopefully it's, it's, it's clear and a little easier for them to read. So in early literacy material, if you have horizontal lists, you would separate them with two blank cells in between, okay? That's one change from the regular guidelines. A mathematical or non-alphabetical signs. Um, so in this case, we have an example here of the word make and the E is crossed out because they want them to drop the E and add ING. So a transcriber's note would be placed on the transcriber's note page of the reference material at the front of the volume and it might say something like this. Words with crossed out letters are uncontracted. Make wasn't a contraction contracted word, so it wasn't a problem in this case, um, then repeated with a hyphen substituted for each crossed out letter. The contracted word is brailed after the uncontracted word. Now you can use your own wording there, of course. This transcriber's note is not in the student work. This is on the transcriber's note page for the teacher to understand what's happening in braille. The student would never read a great big um, uh, transcriber's note of that nature. But what we have is we have the word make, two blank cells, M-A-K and a hyphen to replace that crossed out E, and then two blank cells and the word making uncontracted, and then two blank cells and the word making with the I-N-G contraction, okay? So that it's clear for to the student to see what's, what's happening. Okay, one more quick example. We have hope plus full equals hopeful. And that's a type of example that is often used in um, early literacy um, writing books. Um, so what they, we just brailed what they show, but in this case, we did use the mathematical um, symbols as shown in print, the plus sign and the equal sign. Uh, we just have a blank space around the uh, signs, okay? So there's a space before the plus sign and after the plus sign. So we've got hope plus full, and then a blank cell equals blank cell, hopeful, brailed out in grade one or, or uncontracted braille, and then two blank cells and the hopeful with the contraction. Okay, so that the contracted form is separated from the actual equation that is shown in print. Okay, and again, you would, possibly include a transcriber's note to explain how that was um, treated. Uncontracted braille is used for a word in a word equation and the contracted form is brailled following the equation. So that again would appear only on your transcriber's note page for the teacher's reference, not for the student. All right, I'm looking at my time. 
here and <laughs> got a ways to go yet. Um, guideline for activities to omit, we'll go through quite quickly um, because I've given some good examples um, and these might create some discussions later, but don't omit an activity unless it's necessary, first of all. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not here to just throw out what we might have trouble doing. We have to struggle through and see if we can create it for the student in a meaningful way. But there are some activities that may have to be omitted, and I emphasize the word may. If you can find an alternative way of doing it and make it meaningful, then it should be done. But there are some pictures to be identified by name that would reveal the answer to the activity or the questions we would often have to omit. Uh, we'd have to omit handwriting activities um, unless you do it like the one I showed you with the letter S where the student could braille the letters just for practice. Um, that would be your choice. Lines or boxes depicting the shape of words. We generally don't try and reproduce at all. Uh, puzzles that cannot be successfully reproduced, and there are there are a few. Omitted activities are listed on the transcriber's note page. Let's take a quick look. Now, this picture is at the beginning of every unit in a math book at grade one level. Um, it's very busy. It shows a lot of things. I would suggest it be omitted, and perhaps another student could describe what's happening in the picture uh, because it's talking about patterns and you can see all the patterns there. There's dozens of different types of things that they're showing patterning with. So it might be nice to have a cooperative activity where the students could work together and, and do that. But I certainly wouldn't try and braille it. It's way too busy. It would take page after page. And if you wanted to, I guess you could, uh, but it would be a tremendous amount of work. Here's a Dot to dot, it's a little bee who's trying to get to his beehive and there, there's the um, sort of the flying pattern that he would do done with letters of the alphabet. Um, you can do some dot to dots and I'll show you that coming up, but this one was quite complicated and something like that could, could be um, just omitted. This example shows where you have to trace the number two and then write it again on the line. So those are printing um, and writing numbers and letters. Um, again, the only way you could do this if you didn't omit it would be just to have the student practice writing the number two, if that's what he's learning. Um, the top of the page shows two balloons and he's simply to count the number of balloons and write the number two. You could conclude that by drawing tactily two balloons um, or well, I wouldn't even recommend at grade kindergarten, grade one level, you wouldn't use the words because they wouldn't be able to read them. But it, it could be done with a diagram um, and the student could write the number two. This page shows printing the tracing over the dotted words for Sunday, the days of the week. And I would say that that wouldn't be an activity that would be efficient for a student, but you could simply have the student braille the words um, and learn the spelling of the days of the week if, if that was appropriate instead. The bottom half of the picture shows a collection of several balloons with different colors printed inside them, black, orange, yellow, green. Um, difficult to do, but not impossible. You could do a tactile drawing of those balloons with the color inside. And then sometimes I know some students have smelly markers for colors or colors with braille labels on them, then they maybe could do that activity. Um, again, depending on how the book is being done um, and whether you have the tools to do that. And the last, I think the last one I'm showing you here is the one that shows the, the shape boxes for the words. Um, and we wouldn't try and reproduce that in Braille. Now, what you could do with this activity instead is you could maybe uh, describe the picture very briefly, maybe just one or two words like making a snowman, lead tree without leaves, a girl swimming, and they could write in the word of the season that associates with that picture if you felt that that was something that you could do. Otherwise, it would be, it would have to be omitted. Um, but be creative and try and find ways that you can make the activity meaningful but remember the grade level and the reading level of the student. All right, so guideline nine talks about puzzles. Configuration boxes are presented um, as spaced hyphens uh, for each letter. 
uh, shape of the configuration box is ignored. And we'll see some of that. Word searches are single spaced with blank cells between the letters. Use grade one mode. Use the dot locator to you for use um, and the grade one passage indicator, of course, on either side uh, before and after the, the puzzle. Dot to dots sometimes have to be omitted, but can be created using tactile drawings. Uh, in Braille, the dots shown can be uh, shown using dots two, three, five, six for each dot. Retain the numeric indicator in place of um, and place the numbers where they best fit without interfering with the movement from dot to dot. So your number would be either to the left or to the right, depending on how that student can join the dots. Um, capitalized letters do not need the grade one indicator. Lowercase letters do if it's done as a tactile drawing. All right, so let's look at one quick here. Here's the car. Now this is interesting because it's grade one, so it's double spaced. So we have two centered headings which have double the two blank lines before and after each one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in different colors, in digits, and the words underneath. So what we've done is we've brailled number one followed by the word one, I put in two blank blank spaces. Number two followed by the word two, and then two blank spaces, and so on. We did not reflect the color, it wasn't necessary. Okay. Then they say connect the dots um, from one to 10 and they have an outline of a car with the words one to 10 and dots beside them. And so we've got the dots in the same place on the tactile drawing and we've placed the words in such a way that they should be able to find their way from one dot to another without inter running into the words themselves and they can read them beside them. This one is very similar. Um, in this case, it shows a name at the top of the activity sheet. And that's a school a teacher or a transcription agency decision whether you include the name at the top, it's optional. And, that, and that's in the guidelines itself, but it's optional to include or delete that uh, name line there. Then we have an activity uh, and we have a little poll or no, we have in sentences that tell what to do. Some stars form pictures in the sky, connect the stars, draw lines in number order and use a blue crayon. Okay, so we have that as the instructions and then there's a heading make the little dipper and it shows the dots with the numbers outside in such a way that they can get from number one to number seven without running into, into the dot or into, into the numbers themselves. So that's somewhat doable. Again, it was done as a tactile drawing. This one is similar, a tent, and it's one to 10, and it just shows the outline. So that's just another, another example. This example shows um, a word search. So what we did is it says, find these words, and we listed the words first. And we listed them in two ways, if you look carefully at that. The first set of group, the first grouping fit nicely in vertical columns. So you'll see there's a difference between where some of the words appear. But we, we um, used the minimum of two blank cells between each list, each column, and it did happen to fit. So you could do that. The other way to list it is a horizontal list where you just put two cells between each word and um, follow the rows as they're shown. It's in uncontracted braille because they have to find the words in the puzzle. And so we want the letters to match the letters. Okay. So you could choose either method. Uh, you can only use the vertical list method if it fits the same as it does in print. Otherwise you would use the horizontal method. And there shows you the grid. The grid is single spaced. Uh, with a blank cell between each letter and the um, grade one uh, indicators were before the puzzle and after the puzzle so that we didn't have to have any capital signs or grade one indicators or anything within the puzzle itself. Uh, we just put them before and after the entire puzzle. Okay. This last one I think I've got is um, a crossword puzzle and they're always a challenge but the guidelines in the braille formats are very helpful. So be sure to refer to those. In this case, uh, we list the um, 
words first that they'll be using to fill in their puzzle with. So we have just a word list and we listed it in contracted followed by the uncontracted version in, uh, so that they can find the words to spell them out them in the boxes of the puzzle. Okay, so then we listed the clues after the word list, we listed the clues um, and we double spaced, we put two blank cells, two blank lines, I'm sorry, between each clue so that they could actually braille the word in there if they needed to or wanted to, depending on the teacher's instructions. And then the last section of that, we showed the grid. And this grid is um, from the Braille formats guidelines um, 19.5, I think. And, and it's there for you to look up and it's very well explained. Okay, two more, I think. Um, expendable, consumable material involved single-sided. Begin each activity on a new Braille page. Uh, the name and the date may be omitted or retained depending on the teacher's decision or the agency. Double space for underlining and circling answers. Leave plenty of space if the student is answering on an activity a page. Omit print lines, dashes indicating required answers before and after a question, but use the underscore to represent a print blank within a question. So this sample I've got shows us all of this stuff. I couldn't believe I found Oh no, it's the second one. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so this is similar to a previous one that I was talking about the long Y, or the uh, Y stands for your I, as in the word cherry. Okay, so that little yellow box then is the same as before, and I treated it the same. I didn't include the box, and I didn't include the bold on the E, the I, the Y or the word cherry, which it is in print. The blue box has a centered heading before it, and it's really just the instructions. So of course, no box is necessary for that. The capital Y and the capital E in the instructions are bold, and I did not retain those. And then we have a word list. And I did it in a vertical word list because it fit. Um, otherwise, I would have used horizontal. And then the second part, it says, now try these, and they are to circle the word in the sentence in which the Y has a long E sound. Again, those letters were bold and I didn't retain that. And I double spaced this even though it's grade two so that they could have room to actually circle or underline the word that when they came to it to answer the question, okay? This, uh, this one is similar. Um, this is a new example. It's a grade two, three. In, ex in the way that it shows words and letters in blue. And um, I did not retain the blue color. So that was mainly why I showed you this. I also showed it so that I could show you the um, a transcriber's note. The first sentence is done for them. They're to circle the answer, yes or no, to answer each question. Can a bird fly? And so they show that yes is circled. So what I did in Braille, then I put can a bird fly, I put yes or no underneath it, starting in cell three, and leaving two blank cells between the yes and no answers, and then just directly below that, I got in a transcriber's note that says yes is circled, okay, and I kept it just as simple as I could, um, and then I went on as before to tell the question, and then the answer choices, yes or no, down below them in cell three. Now here's an interesting one. This is the one I wanted to get to. This is a grade two level. It's subjects and predicates. I'm sorry that the black showed up on the page there. But in this assignment, they, this lesson, they've got a box at the top with a bullet in it. And it's saying that every sentence has two parts. They've got the subject is in bold in the sentence. And then the next sentence, the predicate is in bold. Then underneath that, they show an example, and it says the marching band won the championship. Now, the marching band is a single underline uh, for the subject, and won the championship is a double underline for the predicate. And then below that, they've got subject in bold um, and saying that it's the marching band. Predicate in bold won the championship. So in a case like that, we've got bold, we've got single underline, and we've got double underline all for teaching and identifying purposes. So we had to reflect them, or at least I, I felt that we needed to retain those. So there's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, 
So we did retain the bold on the words subject and predicate. We did the single underline indicator um, for the passage. It would be a passage because there's three words. So it would be underline passage indicator before the marching band. And then an indicator, which is a transcriber defined indicator for the double underscore for the one or won the championship. Now that double underscore, an exact, a very similar example to this is found in your braille formats in section 18. So it's it's there for you and it's very well laid out. So if as to exactly how to how to present that in braille. And I was pleased that that was in the in the braille formats. Now we see three, four different formats here of the blank line. In, se in section A, it has four questions and it wants you to add the subject, okay? So we included the underscore for the blank because it's within the sentence. Because if you're adding a, if you're adding a predicate or a subject, if you're adding a subject to each one of these, it's part of the sentence. So we put the underscore in there to indicate that it was part of the sentence. Okay, that's in the A part, there was that. In the B part, it says, add a predicate to each subject. Now, if you look closely at the print, um, and there's four starts to sentences, there's this, the first word, for example, playing, and then blank, and then the period. Because that period is there, that blank is included in the sentence. It is part of the sentence. So again, we use the underscore because it is inside the sentence. Section C says write subject or predicate to tell which part of speech is underlined. So there again, we would have to retain the underline, otherwise they wouldn't know what's what. And we did not have to include the blank um, because it was outside the sentence. It, and we just left room underneath, we double spaced it so that there would be room underneath for them to write subject or predicate. If you felt you needed to put an extra blank line after each sentence to give the student more room, that would be perfectly fine. And then in, yeah, and that's the last section, the fourth section is to draw a line under each subject and each predicate, uh, two lines under each predicate as they did in the example. And so you would leave, in that case, I would suggest leaving two blank lines between each sentence to give the student more, more work or more space to work. All right, this is the last one, storybooks or trade books. And these are always fun because they often appear at the end of math books. Um, and that's a little, um, mm, sorry, just a minute, got ahead of myself again. These are not those. Uh, they're smaller sized books with only one line on each page or, or that sort of thing. And they're often done as twin vision. Okay. And I'm sure most all of you are familiar with print braille or twin vision books and how they're done. Um, it's a regular book that um, have braille added by using clear adhesive labels or have added uh, braille by inserting clear plastic pages in the print and can be read by both the print and the braille reader. And here's a little sample here of just how I used a label and put it inside a book. It's a picture book with one line on each page and the little birds are bathing in the in the water and it talks about them. Um, I think you're probably all familiar with that. Um, the mini books is the other one that I was thinking of that is included often in workbooks. Um, they have their own page numbers and they're intended to be taken out of the book and folded and made into a book of their own. So I'm gonna run through these examples. I've shown you the entire pullout. This is the, the mini book and it's the print sample is sideways to show you that it has two pages. So this is page one and page eight. So that's the front page and the back page because they're going to take them and put them in the format of a book. This one is grade one. This one just happens to be in uncontracted braille because that's the way I did it, but it would be in contracted braille if your student was, if that's the format you were using. This one just happens, no, no specific reason except it was requested in uncontracted braille and that's why it's that way. Um, we have the headings and we have three centered headings. So look at all the <laughs> blank lines that we need in between each centered heading. Then we get to the little four line poem that's shown on the front of that page. And that's all there is there. The second page 
is the one that talks about shopping. Um, and again, we have, um, this is a running head at the very top on line one, math makes sense, one. That's a running head. And then we have a centered heading shopping. We have a paragraph and then a centered heading toy stories and another paragraph. Very, very basic. And the rest of this page is a third paragraph under there that just third and fourth paragraph that just carried over. Okay, so that just shows how the entire page two was done. Okay, this example just shows you page uh, three and I think it's six or something. And it just, I just put it in there as a placeholder to show you that, that those two pages existed. But I wanted to show you page five because it contains a tactile graphic. It says match the shapes you will need. And then it's got a bullet and it says uh, cutouts on heavy paper of each shape. Okay. Each of these shapes, I think it says, yeah. So then the shapes are done as a tactile graphic. You'll notice that there's two blank lines between the words you'll need colon and the first bullet because that's technically a bullet. It's a list. It's only got one item, but it's still uh, formatted as a list. And so there's two blank lines before and after that um, because of the guidelines for um, double spaced material. The second half of this page, then it says time to play colon and then it's got three bulleted lists so those are just done in one and three at the margin like a normal list with two blank lines before and two blank lines after and then following that there's three questions that the students can answer that are just brailed at the page um, this one is interesting and i wanted to show you this this is a hundreds chart board game and i'm sure you've all seen a hundreds chart and gone oh my goodness now how do i do that so there's three ways to do the hundreds chart and you can, you can resolve which way you want to do it. Um, the first one is a tactile drawing. So what I've got here is I've got my running head on the page, two blank lines, hundreds chart game board is the centered heading, but there is not room because of my heading and my running head, there is not enough room to do the hundreds chart because it takes the entire 25 cells and 40 or 25 lines and 40 cells to do a tactile uh, hunter's chart. So I put in a transcriber's note that says chart is on the next page. And there it is. That's the only way you could do it with uh, tactile because of the size needed to squeeze in that 100 at the very bottom corner, you had to make the squares a certain size and that takes the entire tactile page, but it's doable. Okay, so here's two other ways you can do it. On the left, it's done with the two headings and there's room to braille the numbers in, it's double spaced and using the 40 cells, it fits just nicely double spaced. The example on the right is the same thing, only it's single spaced. So it still takes the 40 cells just nicely and neatly, we're happy for that, uh, and it's single spaced. So for older groups, um, say grade two or three, you could, do them this way, just in the braille format without the tactile. Okay, my last example here shows another type of um, small book that is included. Um, and this is how it appeared in print. It's got four of the little pages and you, they want the students to cut them apart uh, uh, horizontally and fold them vertically to, and the page numbers are there so that they can make them into a page, a little booklet from one to uh, seven or eight, I think it is seven. And it's titled My You've Grown. So it's a story about you and how things grow, how animals grow. It shows different pictures of animals and then it shows a picture of a young boy and then it wants you to paste a picture of you. But first you got to put the book together. Now in Braille, this, um, because the pages have just words and I'll, I'll give you an idea. The first one is this book belongs to, and there's a blank. So on the first page, you would braille your name. Then the second page just says, um, uh, you've got a lot from head to toe since you were born. All animals grow and change as they get older. And I'm looking for that page in print. Um, there it is. 
Um, so it's got a picture of a boy standing, measuring his height, and then it's talking about animals. And then the next pages show um, an adult animal and a, a young animal and how they've grown and different things like that. The idea is that I've just included page one, two, and three on one page and four, five, and six on another page. And then seven and eight on another page so that the student could just staple or bind the book in some way and it would be three pages long. I used a, um, a line separator page, page indicator um, in between where the pages change, if you can see. I use the separation line and the number two separation line number three to show the difference in the pages uh, because they just contain sentences that were to be read by the student till you get to the last page where they're to paste a picture of themselves and there I used the UEB box uh, line vertical and horizontal symbols to create a box just to indicate that they were to put a picture in there so that's a, a simpler way that you can that you can create that all right now Honey, I'm questions. just going to yep yeah, oh perfect <laughs> yep that's so, it that that's amazing I'll, I'll give you a, um, a, a minute or uh, to just wrap up but uh, yeah just uh, letting everyone know it's just before 215 so we'll soon open up uh, for questions yeah so that's that's basically it I hope that the examples are useful um, be sure to keep your nose close to the braille formats when doing early literacy as well as the guidelines that we've created these guidelines just show where there will be differences between the Braille formats and what we've chosen because the students are younger and need a little bit of help in different ways. So that's why these guidelines are there. Um, you still rely a lot on the Braille formats for the basic um, formatting. And then these just help with a little bit of the younger students. So that's all I have. We can do questions now, Natalie. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, that was such an interesting presentation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure others here did too. And um, it just really highlights what we already know, right? That you don't just, you know, student doesn't just get a Braille book that's been embossed and put into a, a you know, binding. There's a lot of um, skill and, and thought that goes into it. And, you know, we need to keep supporting um, Braille transcribers and ensuring that students have access to all of these qualified people who, who know exactly how to how to make these materials accessible to the students who use them. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we are going to now um, open it up for questions. So we have Anthony Tibbs, who's our treasurer, who will look at the raised hands in the chat room and call you um, each in order. And so I will turn it over to Anthony. Yeah, just one moment. I have to uh, sign out and sign back in because for some reason my participant list is blank. Um, apparently okay. there's a Zoom bug. So I'll be back in one moment. And uh, No problem. I will start because I know that Debbie earlier on in the presentation had a raised hand that I noticed. So Debbie, would you like to start with your question? Uh, thanks, Natalie. And Bonnie, it was, it was a great presentation. Um, I wish I had the Braille examples to look at while you're doing it, but it's okay. Um, my first question for you is, can you, maybe you want to bring up the spider with the transcriber's note on screen? Um, because then it's back near the beginning uh, of the presentation. My question is, these transcriber's notes, you've actually Brailled the word spider with the S, these transcribers notes are only for the teacher, right? Because if you braille that for the student, they would know the answer. Um, yes, I... you're, you're right to a point, Debbie, except that they, well, they kind of already know the answer because the S is the letter that they're putting in front of each one. So mm -hmm. yes, it is a bit tricky in a case like that. These transcribers notes are actually there in the braille for the student um, because, they wouldn't, well, they might be able to guess from the P-I-D-E-R whether they're, the, and then put the S in front without the picture. That's a good point. Um, if you felt when you're transcribing that the picture, stating the picture wasn't necessary, then definitely leave them off. Um, and yes, 
that's a good point that they kind of do give the answer away. And that's the tricky part of brailing early literacy where pictures are involved. So you, yeah, you might be wise to maybe when make it, uh, the participants here could make a note that that might not be the best way to do it, that it might be better not to put in the transcriber's note saying what the picture is because it gives the answer away and just braille uh, as a list uh, with double spaces or something, the four entries that have the partial word without the S in front. Yeah, that's what I do only because you're giving a braille reader something that the print reader doesn't have. It's, you know, so I guess that's why they have the picture, but yeah, I, I probably wouldn't. Uh, my yeah. second, thanks for your clarification. Okay. Um, okay. My second question is, um, well, I'll save this one. My third question is regarding the Hunter chart. Could mm -hmm. you explain the like, example on the left-hand side a little more clearly? I'm, I, oh, I, okay. I'm not sure that I understand the okay. layout of the examples. Okay, what I've done is I've given three, three different ways that are acceptable to do the hundreds chart. The first one, of course, was the tactile drawing. And then just on my slide presentation, there's two... And the one on the left is double spaced and the one on the right is single spaced. So it's just showing two different ways that you can do it without using a tactile drawing. And I, I just, that it's on one slide is all it is. And so there's, there's right. two samples on one slide, one with, okay. with double spacing and one with single spacing. All right. And my last is strictly a comment. You can park it guys, if you like, do you, I'm not an educator. Um, but my question is, what about, this is designed for kids using a Perkins or a hard copy. Do you guys have kids that are using refreshable Braille devices? And I'm, these guidelines would work either way, except where you have to, in, well, even though they would insert the answers. So my concern is all the extra spacing, if you're using a Braille device, um, it takes up precious real estate, but you can park that comment somewhere if you don't want to address it now. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Again, one has to remember that um, with all these guidelines, if you know the student and you know what system of work they're working with, like what devices they're working with, things can be adapted to suit that. Okay, so that's like fewer, a fewer, thing. yeah, fewer, fewer lines, fewer blank lines, and more blank lines can be added or subtracted depending on um, if you know the student's sit process, then you can adapt it to the student. Okay. The only ones that you have to be a little more rigid with are the ones that are actually being um, produced, bound, cataloged, and put into circulation as a textbook, for for example. But certainly um, for any in-house work with a student, you can certainly adapt things to suit their technology or their skill level or whatever. Yeah. And do they have technology? I mean, I'm not an educator, so I can just ask the general educators. That, is it, are kids using technology at this time, at that age, or are they getting that later on in schools, in your experience? Uh, might let have somebody else, one of the participants, answer that. I not, I never, I haven't worked in this classroom for thirty years. All right. Well, we won't take it now. If someone wants yeah. to answer it later, that's great. Um, yeah. I'm finished, and thank you very much for your presentation, and Natalie for allowing me to ask my questions. Thanks, thank you, Debbie. Debbie. I think next we have uh, Peg. I see your hand. Oh, um, thank you very much for this great presentation. Bonnie, it's been really good. Just a very basic question, and this may be reflected in the examples, of course, but early on when you talked about the vowels A, E, I, O, U, now, the chat, that the, normally you wouldn't have a grade one indicator before the vowels A and A uh, and O, and right. I. So I'm just wondering for consistency, how is that represented? Uh, do you have a Braille um, indicator, grade one indicator, word indicator before that series of vowels or what, how are they represented? No, uh, we, we indicated them each individually. So there would be no oh. indicator before the A, I or O. And then we have a grade one indicator before the E and the U. Okay, we, so that, that normally, now, yeah. 
the vowels a so the word a doesn't stand out in the sentence like it just but i guess the context is clear enough that the, the um, context well and because the teacher would be introducing it yeah in yeah. such a way that they would be looking for them the vowels yeah, yeah. We have to we have to realize that the teacher will have given a prelude to what they see on the page for okay. understanding yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting that you brought that up, Peg. The letter A without the grade one indicator has always bothered me ever since UEB said don't put the grade one indicator when it stands for the letter A. Mm -hmm. That has bothered me all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess because it's so, it's such a small word and it could uh, and I, be like a little word in the sentence, right? It does. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've quandered over that many times because there's a lot of places where that A does appear as a letter right in the middle of a fluid sentence. Exactly. And yeah. I wish the grade one indicator was there because it, how many times when I was proofreading it, I even read it as the word A instead of A, but that's just my little B there. That's a really good point. That's yeah. why I, was I just wondering. really think that those letters need the grade one indicator when they're being mm -hmm. used as letters standing alone. Yeah, but that's just me. <laughs> and that's why I wondered in this situation, whether you'd use a passage indicator before those. Um, a, passage indicator, a passage indicator could be used if the transcriber chose to do it that way. That would not be wrong. The only trouble is they would have to close it after the O and turn it back on for the U anyway, because the oh, and is in the Oh, the word middle. and. Oh, yes. Yeah, then, or they would have to uncontract and. So it was oh, easier yes. to just use the two symbols on the E and the e, U as opposed to having to open and close. And then you got to put it on the U anyway. Yeah. Um, to get it, you know, contracted. So it, yeah. it seemed to me to be a simpler solution to just do them individually. Yeah. Yeah. Since only two out of the five needed it. Yeah. yeah. Our rule of thumb as transcribers with the with the symbols, we've kind of agreed sort of generally that if you hit three symbols, then you use the um, opening and closing indicators. So if you just have one or two in grade one indicators, use them. As soon as you get to three, then it maybe makes more sense to use the opening and closing indicators instead of the individual ones. That's right. just something we've kind of <laughs> chatted about and kind of agreed that that was how we handled things. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Because with the, with the um, letters A-E-I-O-U, which I guess in print or in bold or something, you wouldn't... They are in bold. I, yeah. I think... I, at one time, I think in Braille, you would put the bold face indicators before those letters, but that may probably confusing to have. Well, you see, but not, yeah. And that's why we've chosen not to do it is because in early literacy, especially yeah. this is only <clears throat> kindergarten grade one, they haven't yeah. learned to read fluently enough. If we put the bold indicator in front, we've changed the shape and the look oh, yes, of yes. the letter. And maybe if they aren't solid in what that is, it becomes confusing for them. That's why we're trying early literacy. This was the biggest decision we had to make was to eliminate as many type form changes as possible just to keep the word or the letter looking the way it's supposed to look when they're learning to read. Yeah, well, thank you. So that was a tough call, yeah. but that's what we chose to do. Yeah, sure. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other hands? I don't see any hands up, but any anybody else with a question? Oops. Any other questions? I do see there's something in the chat. So that was responses to the question about when are people um, starting to use technology. I'm trying to mute. I can't oh, find my here, mute. Peg. I'll I'll well, I'll help you. There we go. There you go. Uh, it worked. So somebody said uh, we have a grade two student who is just being introduced to the Braille Note Touch this year, not yet doing workbooks in it. And we also have a high school student who is using a Brilliant to access textbooks. And I think I, I from what I remember, from what uh, we've heard in, in British Columbia in particular, there isn't a lot of hard copy Braille. A lot of things are being provided electronically now. So my guess is that in BC, more students are, are perhaps using technology, particularly in high school, than, than uh in the younger grades, but uh, any yeah, other secondary? Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, it, it sounds like there might be a good topic for a new another workshop is on some of the technology that students are using out there. Yeah, and when and how and yeah, yeah, yeah what, really interesting because 
that spatial information, right, that you lose when you have a single line braille display until until we finally have that multi line display we're all waiting for. <laughs> so that's great. Okay, so I'm I don't see any other um, questions or hands being raised. So I'll just take the last few minutes to thank you again, Bonnie, for taking some time out of your Saturday to speak with us and everyone for attending for all the great questions. Um, for those of you who haven't attended one of our workshops before, uh, we do offer these every two months through different committees that organize these, teaching and learning, Braille promotions. So we uh, try to vary the topics to meet uh, the interests of our different members, Braille users, transcribers, teachers, parents. If ever you have topics that you feel would be of interest to you, you can always write to us at info at blc-lbc.ca. You can learn more about Braille Literacy Canada by visiting our website, which is brailleliteracycanada.ca. And you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at BRLLitCan, all one word, BRLLitCan. Um, and you can find out about our future workshops. They're all free of charge to members. Um, our membership year starts on January 1st. So it's, it's getting to be around that time to renew or to become a member. Um, and you can learn more about our other membership benefits by looking at our website or by just reaching out to us um, if you have any questions at all. So uh, thank you again, Bonnie. And with that, we will close off the talk for today. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.